All right, in this lecture, we're going to continue with chapter 11, uh, discussing torque and angular momentum. All right, so let's first define what angular momentum is. We talked about linear momentum before. We said that a, an object with mass that has velocity has a momentum associated with it. Um, and just a reminder, linear momentum was given with uh, either a lowercase or a capital P. And it was a vector because it has the, a velocity component in it. So the angular momentum is going to be written as such. It's, we're going to use either a capital L or a lowercase l. Usually you'll use a capital L if you're talking about the total angular momentum. Uh, and you lose, use a lowercase l if you're talking about a particular angular momentum for maybe one particle. All right, so it's going to be capital L, which is our angular momentum, is equal to the cross product of r, which is our distance away from that object, or crossed with our linear momentum. Now this can also be written as the mass, because we know linear momentum here again is mass times velocity. So if we change our p to mv, and of course this is going to be a vector, it's really just the mass, which is a, which is a constant, it's a scalar, we can pull that out. And then it's just going to be r cross v. So either of these would work. It sort of just depends on what information that we're given. If we're given the linear momentum, we can use the uh, equation with p. If we're given maybe the radius vector and the velocity, then we will use uh, the second equation. All right, so this is angular momentum. And just like linear momentum, um, angular momentum means that some object with mass is going to have the tendency to cause, uh, to stay in rotation, right? Okay, um, so another way we can write this, again, we can use little l, which is usually written as the cursive l, right? So either one would work, and your book uses both. Um, it's going to be equal to r and v sine theta. We know so that the, the cross product of two vectors is going to be those two vectors multiplied by each other multiplied by sine of the angle in between those two vectors, right? So phi here is going to be the angle between the vectors. You can also write this as r times the perpendicular component of the uh, linear momentum or r times m times the perpendicular component of the velocity or the perpendicular component of your r vector, right, in either case. They're just different ways of writing the same thing. So reading the caption here, saying defining angular momentum, a particle passing through point A, as shown here, uh, has some linear momentum, which is mass times the velocity of that particle, with the vector uh, P lying in the xy plane. The particle has an angular momentum, which is L is equal to R cross P, with respect to the origin. All right, so this particle is going to have some angular momentum with respect to some uh, in this case, we're just going to use the origin as the axis. So if we wanted to find the direction of the angular momentum, again, we're going to use our right-hand rule. So what you would do is take this momentum vector and put it at the tail of your radius vector. So you want, when you do the right-hand rule, you want the tails of the vectors um, at the same point. So if I just take this vector and I slide it over here to the... Um, to the origin, you see that the angle in between these two vectors is called phi. And if I do the right hand rule, since it's r cross v, I put my hand in the direction of r, so my hand is going to go down in this direction, starting from the origin and going down. And then when I curl my fingers to the left, in this case, or counterclockwise, if I curl my fingers counterclockwise, my thumb is going to be pointing in this z direction. So therefore I know that the angular momentum L is going to be in the positive z direction. Right? That's how I would find the direction for that. Okay. Um, let me just talk briefly on the idea that we were talking about with these perpendicular components, right? So really we're only worried about the perpendicular component of the vector with respect to the other vectors. So for instance, if I use r, right, the angle perpendicular to r for 90 degrees is going to be right here, which means that if this is my um, angular momentum, or excuse me, my linear momentum vector, 
All I care about is the perpendicular component of that vector, which is shown right here. Okay, and you can see that our angle phi ends up being right there as well. Um, alternatively, I can look in the direction of my linear momentum, which is shown here, and look at just the, the perpendicular component of the radius vector. So if this is our radius vector, all I really care about, basically if I would extend this line out, I could find the perpendicular component of my radius vector. So that would be this component here. All right, so if you knew this component and you knew this component, you would not need to know the angle necessarily between them. You could just multiply those two together because right? that's all we're really worried about. So by multiplying by multiplying this vector times the sine of your angle phi, you get this opposite vector here. All right, so you would just multiply this by that. So let's go ahead and do an example. Um, so the figure shows an overhead view of two particles moving at a constant momentum along the horizontal paths. Particle one with mom momentum magnitude P1 is equal to five kilograms meters a second. Just a reminder, the unit for our linear momentum is kilograms meters a second. Has a position vector of R1 with, uh, and it will pass two meters from that point. So at the closest position, it's going to be two meters away from point z uh, from our origin, or point, point zero. Uh, particle two with momentum of P2 is equal to 2.0 kilogram meters a second has position vector of R2 and will pass four meters, all right? So the closest point of R2 is going to, this right here is going to be four meters, this right here is going to be two meters. All right, so what are the magnitude and the direction of the net angular momentum L about point O of the two particle system. All right, so to find the total amount of angular momentum, we can first find the individual angular momentum of each separate particle. All right, so that's what we'll do. Now, the easiest, um, because we're given the perpendicular component, is just going to be then to multiply this perpendicular component by um, the, the perpendicular component of the radius, rather, by your linear momentum. All right, so for instance, our angular momentum for particle one is going to be equal to the perpendicular component of the radius of one times its linear momentum. All right, so that's simply going to be 2.0 meters times 5.0 kilograms meters a second. And you get, oops, and you get a angular momentum of, ten, oops, ten kilograms. And if we look at the unit here, we have meters times kilograms meters a second. So our unit is going to be kilograms meters squared over seconds. All right. So to find the direction of this linear momentum or the angular momentum. Uh, we're going to use the equation and then we're going to use the right hand rule. So for instance, if, so if we're looking at particle one here, if again, if I bring uh, the tails of them together, so if I bring this p vector down to the tail of the r vector, so it's going to be kind of right down here in this, in this direction, I put my hand in the direction of r1 and then I curl it around in the counterclockwise direction, so you'll see that you end up with out of the page, your thumb is pointing out of the page, so you know that it's going to be a positive uh, 10 kilograms meters squared a second. Now, we can do the same thing for our second uh, particle. All right, so the angular momentum for our second particle is going to be R2, the perpendicular component of R2, times oops, our linear momentum of 2. So that's going to be 4.0 meters times 2.0 kilograms meters a second. All right, so our angular momentum is then going to be 8.0 kilograms meters squared a second for the angular momentum. Now again, we can do the cross product. What I want to do is take my, let me go ahead and erase this stuff. I want to take this linear momentum vector and put it at the tail of my R2 vector, which is going to be right here. 
I'm going to put my hand in the direction of R2 and then curl it around clockwise to get to the uh, momentum vector. All right, and when I do that, my hand needs to be, my thumb needs to be facing down in order for that to happen. All right, so since my thumb is facing down, that's going to be into the page. We'll call that negative. So we end up with a negative sign in front of the, of the angular momentum uh, for the second part. Now, another way to think about this is, okay, is this giving me a counterclockwise rotation or is this particle going to give me a clockwise rotation? So, for instance, if I look at P1 and if I base it from the origin, I know, okay, well, this particle is certainly going to give me a counterclockwise rotation around P1 or around um, P0 or PO, rather, the, the origin point. Uh, and this particle is going to give me a clockwise rotation. Right, so I know that they must be subtracted from each other. I know that they're going to sort of cancel each other out in a sense. All right. <clears throat> all right, so now all I need to do is find what the total momentum is. So we're going to use big L for that. So this is just going to be the angular momentum of our two particles. So it's going to be 10 plus a negative 8. All right, so our total angular momentum is 2 kilograms meter squared per second. All right. And the plus side sign means uh, that your angular momentum is going to be out of the page, which means you have a counterclockwise rotation. All right. So now let's look at Newton's second law in angular form again. Okay, so the vector sum of all the torques acting on a particle is equal to the time rate of change of the angular momentum of that particle. All right, so let's see where this comes from. All right, so let's start with our equation for angular momentum. It's angular momentum is equal to, this is a vector, uh, m times r cross v. All right, that's just our definition for angular momentum. And now I want to take the derivative of both sides. So when I do that, the derivative with respect to time. So you have uh, dl dt on one side. Basically, this is on the left side, it's the time rate of change of the angular momentum is equal to mass times. So we're taking the derivative of a cross product. So what we're going to do is take the first times the derivative of, of the second plus the derivative of the first times the second. All right, so that is going to look like, so it's going to be r cross dv dt plus dr dt cross v. So does everyone see what I did there? I took the first value, crossed it with the derivative of the second, plus the derivative of the first value crossed with the second. Okay, so that's what we end up with here. All right, so let's go ahead, simplify this a little bit. This is a DL. All right, so you have the mass. Now, in this first term, we have r crossed with the dv dt. Well, we know that dv dt is the acceleration. So really, this is just r crossed with our acceleration vector. Oops. Um, and then in our second term, well, dr dt is velocity. So what you really end up with is your velocity vector crossed with your velocity vector. And since these vectors are the same vector and they're going to be facing in the same direction, the sign of zero is going to be zero. So this whole term is just going to be zero, right? So they're in the same direction. So you can't cross the, a vector with itself. Okay, so what we really end up with then is dl dt is equal to the mass times r cross a. Right? Or other, you could also write this as r cross ma. Right, we're just moving the constant m into it. Well, we know that m times the acceleration vector is our force vector. So we get dl dt is equal to r cross with our force vector, our net force. All right, and this can also be written as the summation of r cross f. So basically, all the, all the particles added together 
um, or excuse me, all the torques of all the particles, right? Because this is R cross F. R cross F is our torque. So really what we end up with is our net torque is equal to the time rate of change of our angular mo momentum. Okay, so now let's, we sort of did a, an example similar to this where we had a system of particles, but maybe you had a lot of particles. Um, so what would we do, what, how would we find angular momentum of that? And we're going to kind of follow what we did before. So we're going to say that, well, the total angular momentum L of the system uh, is the vector sum of the angular momentum little l of the individual particles. Okay, so this, what this would look like is your total angular momentum is just going to be all your little angular momentums for each individual particle added together. However many particles are, let's just say there's n number of particles plus. And so really this is just the summation of all of the angular momentums added together. So we can just use our summation symbol from i is equal to 1 to however, however many there are. Now, with time, the angular momenta um, of individual particles may change uh, because of interactions between the particles or with outside. Right? So this angular, each angular momentum might not stay constant. Right? So this is going to change with time. We'll just take the derivative of both sides again. That's equal to 1 to n. Right? So now we have the derivative of this. Well, in the previous slide, we just saw that the derivative of your angular mo momentum vectors uh, is going to be the net torque. So this is also equal to the summation of the net torque. And we can just call this I, all the torques added together, basically. Okay, so therefore, the net external torque acting on a system of particles is equal to the time rate of change of the system's total angular momentum. All right, so again, we end up with a very similar equation, um, but this is really just for a system of particles. So if you had a bunch of particles, the time rate of change of the total angular momentum is going to be equal to our net torque. Okay, that's it for this lecture. We will pick it up next time.